and y algebraic, then um, you have k of x. Okay, maybe I will give you, show you the next slide, and then it becomes more clear. The important thing that k of x is in fact a field. So this is a claim. For any algebraic x, k of x is a field. It's not hard, so proof. But this is really important. You have multiplication by x, or by anything, y, whatever. x, any element of this uh, finite dimensional, so k of x is finite dimensional algebra, a ring over k. You have multiplication by x from k of x to itself. And this is a fine dimensional, but it belongs to a field k big, because everything, all the numbers we take are from some bigger field. This means that it has no zero divisors. Then you, this is, uh, has no kernel. So kernel of, k, of Lx. So this is a map uh, taking some z and mapping it to xz. This multiplication map, multiplication by x. The kernel of this map is 0, but this is a linear map over a fine dimensional vector space. This means that it is surjective. So Lx is surjective. And then uh, Lx of some, there exists there exist a z such that Lx of z is equal 1, right? because it's subjective, and then xz is equal 1, and you can invert x. And you can invert every non-zero vector, non-zero point, non-zero, yeah, non-zero vector in this uh, ring. OK. Uh, then this is actually a field. So you have x and y algebraic. You take. Let's call k1 a field k small of x. This fine dimensional over k small. And then you have k2, uh, which is a k1 of y. And we know that y is a root of a polynomial with coefficient k small. But this means that it is a root of polynomial coefficient k1. Uh, so this is fine dimensional over uh, k, uh, k1. OK, and k1 is finite dimensional over k, over k. Then it is finite dimensional over k, well, over k small. Because you can take a basis in k1 over k small and then express every vector in here through this basis. Through First, you, you take a basis over k1, and then you take el every element in this, I mean, this finite basis, and then it's expressed through some basis over k small. So if you have a mm, two like k uh, containing k one, k two containing k one containing k small, this fine dimensional over that, this fine dimensional over that, then this is fine dimensional that you just take like product of basis. But then this is k two is just k small of x and y. This fine dimensional algebra, and it contains some product, whatever, difference. So algebraic numbers constitute a field. This is important and uh, really used in number theory all the time. Like you can take square root of mm, tenth power of say five plus square like root of tenth power I don't know seventeenth uh, power of seven, and this is algebraic number. It's sort of not obvious if you try to find the polynomial for which this is root. Mm, it will take some work, but this is very simple and non-explicit argument which proves that this sum is also algebraic. 
Okay. Yeah, and of course, the argument that I give to you, it's very general. It's if you have a division uh, ring commutative, it's a field. I mean, fine dimensional commutative division rings are fields. Uh, sorry, not, div not division, but just without zero dividers. <coughs> okay. Now, algebraically closed fields. So, who heard about them already? Not everybody is happy, but uh, I will. Well, it's not hard. So, uh, so definition field K small is algebraically closed. Well, uh, first I should define algebraic extension. So, K containing K small, algebraic extension. Extension. If this was actually on the previous slide, uh, right? No, even previous slide. Yeah, this is the definition. Uh, algebraic extension: if all elements of K are algebraic over K small. The typical example is the field which is denoted Q bar, which is field, say it's example, field of algebraic numbers, numbers over Q. As we just discussed, this is a field because you can add things, uh, but it's clearly infinite dimensional. So it's not a, yeah, it's not fine dimensional extension, but it is like infinite dimensional algebraic extension. OK, and definition, k is algebraically closed if all algebraic extensions of k are trivial. And of course, I will prove, like, in a couple of minutes of theorem, um, stating that uh, the field C, C is algebraically closed. This is more or less the, the fundamental theorem of algebra, but let me explain that. It turns out that algebraically closed fields are precisely fields where every polynomial has a root. So theorem. If we have mm, k is a field, uh, then k is algebraically closed if and only if for each polynomial p in the polynomial ring, a k of t a degree of polynomial p of t, degree of polynomial Mm, bigger than zero, uh, p of t has a root in k. Is the statement clear? Good. Uh, so let's prove it. Okay, the idea is that there is a procedure allowing you to construct a uh, extension from a polynomial. So suppose that P of T is irreducible. Then uh, K of T is irreducible polynomial. K of T, the quotient by P, is mm, without the divisors. This is uh, very similar to the main uh, fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which says, so compare, that if you have p inside z prime, this is the ideal generated by p, uh, then this equivalent to 
uh, z quotient by the pr principal ideal generated by the by the prime p uh, being uh, without these divisors. Do you know this theorem? So do you remember the proof? Who remembers the proof? So the idea of the proof is that you have to use um, Euclid, Euclidean algorithm, division. So if you have two uh, A and B uh, such that um, A, B is, a, is divisible by P, this is precisely means that there are zero divisors in that ring. Uh, then um, you can use uh, Euclidean algorithm, and since they are not divisible by p, uh, a k plus p n is equal to one for some k n. n. This is division. I mean, you you divide a by b with a reminder. You obtain some reminder. You do again. And then at the end, you obtain the com common divisor. You can express the maximum common divisor of A and P uh, in, in terms of this um, sum. And then uh, <coughs> this, uh, this has to be 1 because P is prime. OK, but then this means that uh, A is invertible. It can't be 0 divisor. Because if if a b is equal um, zero, you can multiply it by k. A k b is equal to zero as well. But a k is one modulo p, so b is equal zero modulo p. So if you have a ring where every element is invertible, it can't have. Uh, Zero divisors, and then the same is true because you have also Euclidean division algorithm for polynomials. So this is just the same. I mean, this is the same statement, and the proof is the same. Do you want me to give you, I mean, the same kind of as handouts for this division? Okay, yeah. So you have a field. As we just discussed, this fundamental, right? I mean, uh, this fundamental because uh, you can, I mean, it's easy to see that this fundamental. And then uh, it's fundamental, it has no zero divisor, so it's a field. This is a way of obtaining a field. And of course, if you have um, some element z inside this bigger field, which contains k small. And if uh, z is algebraic, uh, then mm, k small of z is a quotient of you know, the polynomial ring, because it's generated by z, so it's a quotient of polynomial ring by some ideal. But the polynomial ring is actually principal ideal domain. Do you know this? Who knows this? Polynomial rings are principal ideal in the sense that all ideals are generated by polynomial. I mean, suppose I have two polynomials. Then you can use again Euclidean division algorithm and express their maximal common divisor as a linear combination. So if you this means that you, if you have two uh, polynomials in some ideal, then uh, they both are generated by the same elements of this ideal. OK, then you have any number of polynomials, they're all generated by one polynomial. This means that every ideal in a polynomial ring is principal, generated by one polynomial. OK, so this is quotient by polynomial. And obviously, uh, this is the same construction. So this polynomial will be clearly, z will be root of this polynomial. OK, but since we don't have all polynomials which are, uh, this should be also a reducible polynomial. If it's, not, if it's not irreducible, then it has zero divisors, which is prohibited. 
But there are no identities of polynomials if uh, all polynomials have roots. So this means that you have no algebraic elements in any field which is bigger than k. So if, if this is true, you have no algebraic elements in any bigger field. If you have no algebraic elements in any bigger field, uh, uh, this means you start with a certain polynomial, you reduce it into product of irreducible polynomials, and for each of this irreducible polynomial, it gives you extension of your field, which is prohibited by if it is algebraically closed. OK. Was I clear? Should I like go on, repeat something? Please ask questions. I would really appreciate if you can ask any questions, please. But anyway, uh, so we have this uh, we have this uh, equivalence, and this means that I mean uh, you know that. Over C, every mm, polynomial has a root. This fundamental theorem of algebra. Then it is algebraically closed by this theorem. OK. Questions? What else do we know about C? Uh, OK, now we can look at the transcendental uh, uh, elements. So if you have. Uh, C and certain extension which is big, strictly bigger then K contains a transcendental element as we just discussed but this means that all P of T are non-zero uh, if P in this is non-zero in K if P is non-zero polynomial in uh, C of T. OK, so th this means that uh, this uh, the, the subfield generated by um, T is actually uh, contains all fractions of all polynomials. And the, the ring of fractions of polynomials is rational function rings. So this means that um, this bigger field contains a subfield a C of a T, rational functions. Functions which are quotients of polynomials of polynomials. In our case, it's C of t. OK, what is, now I will just remind you what was last time. So we had this basis is in infinite dimensional spaces. If you have a infinite dimensional space, it has a basis. What is a basis? It's a set of vectors which are linear independent. And you can express your uh, vector space. I mean, any vector in this vector space is a linear combination of mm, vectors in a basis. And basis always exist. This uh, is a consequence of set theory, which we discussed. And you have them in your assignments. If somebody doesn't have assignments, please take them. OK, uh, so you have a basis. And then the important thing that, OK, if you have two sets, uh, it's, there's actually a word called equinumerous. Uh, so the two sets are equinumerous if there are bijection between from one to another. And the, what is uh, important about basis is that this uh, result, which you can find in the second assign, uh, handout, so theorem. If V is vector space, and you have basis, 
S1, S2 basises, uh, then uh, there exists a bijection. So they are equinumerous. Bijection between S1 and S2. Well, for fine dimensional spaces, I'm sure you know this because this is the first uh, result of linear algebra that uh, dimension is well defined. But it turns out that the same is true for infinite dimensions, and you will have handouts uh, to see that. So you can speak of dimension even if your space is infinite dimensional, it will be just cardinality of the basis. It's well defined. Do you have any questions? OK, now we can discuss dimension of the rational functions. And this was again done last time, just slightly. Uh, so theorem, you have a field C of a T of rational functions, functions is continual dimension. So its dimension of this set is continuum, continual dimensional over C. So you consider this field as a vector space over C, and it is continual dimension. And the proof is very easy. You just take rational functions with a single pole, like uh, proof 1 over t minus ai is linearly independent. Independent. And this is clear if you just think of function theory, because if you add functions with poles in different points, the sum will have poles in all these points. Can't be, uh, there can't be any linear dependency, because I mean, you, the poles are well defined. And if you add functions with two different poles, the sum will have poles in both of these points. But there is a formal proof which we had last time. If you like, I can repeat this formal proof, but it's just a computation. It's easy. You just uh, take a sum of these guys. You uh, multiply by a maximal, minimal common denominator, and you obtain some polynomial relation which is impossible. Questions, comments? OK, now I can finish by proving Hilbert Nullstein sets, which is a essentially a form of mm, mm, fundamental theorem of algebra. So it states that if you have an ideal, uh, it has co common zeros. Or if you have a maximal ideal, it is ideal of a point. So theorem. If you have, um, see, so a fine variety, as we discussed last time, is a, a common zeros of uh, common zeros of a polynomial ring. So the ring of functions on a fine variety is a quotient. So I will state it. For, for today's purpose, I will state as follows. You have the polynomial ring, t1 dot dot tn, polynomial rings, polynomial ring. And you have i inside this ring, maximal ideal. And then i is maximal ideal of a point. Uh, this means that it is an ideal of uh, functions, ideal of all functions of a point Z uh, or A. E vanishing in A. 
Uh, here, state, state is slightly more general because I stated as a statement about here in, I mean, the, instead of taking the whole polynomial ring, you can take ring of functions on some algebraic variety, polynomial functions. It will be a quotient. But if you have a maximal ideal in a quotient ring, this gives you maximal ideal in the ring. So if you have, so if you have R is a quotient of C of polynomial ring uh, by some uh, ideal, J, a maximal ideal, maximal ideals in R is the same as maximal ideals in this polynomial ring containing uh, j. Is this clear? So ideals in the quotient are the same as ideals containing j. And this would be directive correspondence maximal means that the quotient by this ideal is a field. So this it's maximal ideal here if and only if it's maximal there. Because quotient doesn't even see where I mean it is independent. Okay, so you, instead of writing that you can just uh, take instead of R you can take any quotient, it will be the same. Okay, so step step one. So proof. Uh, we start with, uh, yeah. I, I want to prove that the quotient is a C. This is what I want to prove, but. Mm. For uh, we take uh, j this ma i this maximal ideal inside r maximal ideal. Then i contains c just the scalars. It's a mm, sorry r by i. This is a field. So it's an extension extension of C. Okay, step two. Now I'm interested in, in, in what is dimension of this mm, field. This would bring a contradiction unless this is, mm, so I want to prove that this field is a C. But first, uh, it's countable. Uh, it's countable dimension, because R, mm, the R ring R, this polynomial ring, is generated by monomials. There are countably many monomials, and this is a quotient. So R uh, over I is countably dimensional. Dimensional over C. Am I clear? So the polynomial ring is countably dimensional. It's uh, generated by monomials. This is a quotient. So the quotient is also generated by the same monomials. And then it is the countably many. So this was step two. And step three brings to a contradiction because uh, so step three. There's lemma one on the previous slides, which is um, the transcendental extension of C is an uncountable dimension. So um, C, so you have this extension, R, R over I, containing C, um, unless it is equal, R over I is equal to C. Uh, otherwise, it contains a transcendental element, as we proved. R over I contains, as a subfield, C of uh, rational functions for some transcendental T. 
This is what we proved. And then uh, it's uncountable dimension, which is contradiction with step two, uncountable dimension. Uh, which impossible. This means that R over I is just colors. I mean, C is already there, but it's not bigger. It's a field which is equal to C. OK, now I will produce you the point. It's easy. So you take coordinate functions, t1 uh, tn. Uh, coordinates functions. This is elements in this ring, R, which is C of T1 dot Tn. And I have the function phi from R to C, which is just a quotient of R over I. Then take phi of T1 which is a1, phi of t2 is a2, and so on. Obtain a point a, which is a1, a2, and so on, a n. I claim that it is a common 0. a is common 0 of this ideal i. So all elements in i vanish in a. Then it is the max. It will be the ideal of this point. Indeed, a phi. So we are interested in take some p inside i, p inside this ideal i. This certain polynomial, and I, I want it. I I am interested in um, p. In eval I, I want to evaluate p in a1 dot a n. And this is the same as mm, p of phi mm, of t1 dot p of phi of tn. Because this is the phi. Phi takes. Mm, t to a. a is a number, and t is a uh, variable. But this is same as phi of p, and this is 0. So this means that p belongs to i if and only if p vanishes on this point. So this last step is a tautology. There is nothing said there except that we just formally substitute phi inside in, in your polynomial. Do you have any questions, comments? No? Good. So to continue, I would have to give you some background on categories. So how many of you know already the definition? Please raise. Well, so category is uh, something which you always work in mathematics, but sometimes you just don't call it category. But it is it's just like a sets. I mean, everybody worked with sets before counter, but then a counter introduced the sets, and people started calling them sets and tried to do the axiomatics and so on. For categories, you don't even need that much axiomatics because there are not that many contradictions. So Cantor worked with set theory actually without axioms, but then uh, he discovered that it is full of contradictions. So you have to do some axioms, otherwise you just would uh, ar arrive at a point which makes no sense. For categories, you don't need axioms, you just, but still there are some, uh, so category, definition, category is the following data. Set of set of objects and morphisms, more, which are also sets of from A to B, where A, so it's called ob of C, where A and B objects. 
And there are two, uh, and this, this is the first, second. So there are two sets, and there is the composition operation. If you have uh, phi inside, inside morphisms from A to B, you have psi inside morphisms from B to C. This gives you composition phi times psi in morphisms from A to C. Uh, notice that I use composition in what is non, not always standard order. But for categories, it's natural, yeah? This will be at the next slide. You're right, yeah. This is important, but we could have a class instead of sets. Yeah, and there's also there's another uh, piece of a data, isomorphism. So um, there is an uh, exceptional marked uh, set called I, uh, I mean identity, identity um, inside more from x to x. Identity of x and axioms, axioms, which are also clear. So this you should think of this as some mathematical objects like vector spaces, rings, groups, and these are homomorphisms. And axioms is first associativity, so phi times psi times what what the next row is equal to phi times psi times rho associativity of composition. And the second axiom is identity. So identity identity times uh, phi is the same as phi times identity y is the same as phi, where uh, phi is a map from, is a morphism from x to y. Again, the order is not always standard. But I always use in the order because it's from category point of view, it's more natural. Questions? This was the definition. Now examples. Yeah, isomorphism. Isomorphism is something, uh, so already from this data we can define it. So mm, phi inside of morphisms with definition. Morphism from x to y is isomorphism if uh, f there exists psi from morphisms, it's a morphism from y to x, such that psi times phi is phi times psi is identity. Of course, there are different identities. In fact, this is identity in uh, y and this identity in x. Uh, do you want me actually to make a break in the middle of the class. So if you want, it's probably a good time to make a break for five minutes. Do you want to? Good. So we meet in, if my timing is right, in uh, 26 minutes past two. And this is the list of, of examples of categories, you can try to think, well, you probably know this very well, but uh, if you don't think of why this is categories, <laughs> like check the axioms. Yes, and somebody, if you didn't take the, the handouts, you can. This was for the last, uh, no problem. And of course, you for each of the categories, you have to define the co corresponding morphisms. And for it will be homomorphisms for vector spaces, for rings, gro group fields, with just any maps for sets. And for topological spaces, it will be continuous maps. Well, you can take 
but it's better to have continuous maps. And for smooth manifolds, just smooth maps. And of course, any other mathematical structure can give you category. So everything could and should be stated in categorical language. This simplifies the matters a lot. No functors. So the, the important thing about categories is that mm, there are many things in disguise are the same. For instance, consider the category of all vector spaces. And consider category of vector spaces with countably many objects, with the objects like zero space, r, r square, r3, and so on. This is one category. Another category are all vector spaces, fine dimensional vector spaces, spaces over r. The second case, this is not even a set. The, the set of objects is a class of objects, because there are, of course, like many different vector spaces, and there are so many that they're not even a set. And here you have just countably many. These two things are the same category, which is sort of uh, very natural from a mathematical point of view, but contradicts our set theoretic assumptions. And this is why you have to Mm, deal with these uh, functors, natural transforms of functors, and so on. So functor is easy. So a functor is just morphism of categories, essentially. If you have category C1, C2 categories, you have map, let's call it F. F is a map from C1 to C2. And then uh, it is a map from morphisms for morphisms from f from x to y to morphisms from f of x, f of y. So you have, this is the collection of data for a functor. You have to have a map from objects to objects. So it's f from objects to c of c1 to objects of c2. From morphisms to morphisms, then you have to uh, so compositions f commutes with compositions, compositions maps identity to identity. So the typical example of a functor is, for instance, mm, you can start from a vector space and take vector space plus itself, or it's tensor square of this vector space. Or consider a group and map it to a group of its automorphisms. Any natural uh, operation on a category is a functor. And mm, it's just, when you say natural, it's ambiguous. The good thing is uh, to say functorial, because it's uh, the natural which makes sense. So the f notion of functor simplifies uh, stating different theorems, because this for instance, you have no, no is natural isomorphism between vector space and this dual vector space. So the, we know that for fine dimensional spaces, V is isomorphic to V dual, but this is non natural. It's very hard to state that it's non naturality if you don't use categories. But if you use, you can just state that there is no functor. And you pr can prove it, it's not hard. OK. Yeah. So how you, you, you define equivalence, probably it's the next slide of equivalence of, of categories. Yeah. No. I should tell you. So this was functors. Anyway, let me tell you about this uh, set theoretic problems which you mentioned. So the problem is, of course, if you want to have, I mean, this defines you, the, the functors define you morphisms on categories, but the problem is that categories are not, category of all categories is not categories, just the set of all sets is not a set. 
It's a class. This is a set theoretic problem, which is sort of hard to resolve because you have to do with different axioms. And the category theory was invented by, um, in part by Grothendieck, who just added to the set theory another axiom, which is called universal axiom, universum axiom. And it says that you have a very big set, like such a big set that you cannot reach by all natural operation. It's uh, what is called unreachable cardinal. And then uh, you say that, OK, the small category is a category where uh, all objects and morphisms are elements of this universal. And then uh, the big category is category without this restriction. For instance, you can cons if you consider the category of all small categories, small category is a category which has this property. And the category of all categories is not small because the set of all small sets is not small. So this is set theoretic. If you don't care about set theory, just forget about it because it's not nobody cares. I mean, it's uh, the import. If it is important, if you did, if you sort of try to base your mathematics on set theory, but most people work with categories. They don't base mathematics on set theory. They base mathematics on categories. In fact, it's better foundation. So they don't. This was, in terms of Grothendieck, this was important because then people tried to base the set theory on the mathematics on set theory. Now, not many people care about the small categories. So you can ignore that, or you can read some book. Like, uh, the best book is Maclean. Uh, Maclean, Category for Working Mathematicians. OK. Yeah, there is examples of functors. You have a map from x to the from a set to set of all its subsets, two power x. It's a natural functor, square, topological space to its square, v to v plus v. Identity functor is a very natural functor. I mean, category just to itself with everything mapped by identity, and then. Uh, you can forget things. Like forget, take a, a, like topological spaces or groups and forget that it was topological space. Just forget topology, forget the group structure. This will give you a functor to sets. All, all, all natural things are functors. Questions? Important thing that not this, I def what I defined here to you is actually covariant functor. There is also contravariant functors, like v to v dual, because it inverts the arrows. So this was covariant functor, contravariant functor. Is a map from you have objects of C1 to objects of C2. But then morphisms from x to y are mapped to morphisms from f of y to f of x. This inverts arrows. And then composition is also inverts. The arrow and identity go, goes to identity. This is very similar, except that you, mm, in fact, you can define it as follows. So you have, if you have c as a category, you can uh, define c opposite. The same objects. But morphisms from x to y in C uh, is the same as morphisms from y to x in C op. And composition is taken in opposite order. This like you can start with a group and just invert the order of multiplication. You will have group with opposite multiplication. Very similar. And then a uh, contravariant functor is just a functor from C op to C, C1 op to C2. OK, there are examples. Uh, so if you know about continuous function, oh, this is actually what we have discussed already. So I can give you this example. So if you have a um, category, say, uh, topological spaces, you have a covariant, contravariant functor to ring. 
In fact, there are Banach rings. So you just x goes to C0 continuous functions on x. Continuous functions. Because if you have x to y, then the corresponding map of rings is C0 of y to C0 of x. As usual, you take a composition of a function with a map. OK. Uh, Mm, yeah, there is another uh, case of contravariant functions. You can do this with covariant as well. Is representable functors? This is a functor. Where it's a functor to sets from C to sets. Namely, you take objects x in uh, C. And you take y goes to home, uh, to more, from mm, x to y. This is contravariant. If you want covariant, you take invert. You take morphisms from y to x. OK. So equivalence of functors. Why this is tricky again? Because uh, we want equivalent. Uh, we want the categories to be equivalent without uh, having the same sets of objects. So if you have two functors f one, f two, equivalent, if you have. Uh, yeah, this isomorphism is something we discussed. And then uh, you have isomorphisms. So you have x goes to y from f1, x for y1, mm, x goes to y2 from by f2. You have to have an is uh, so f equivalence, natural equivalence, natural equivalence is isomorphism isomorphism from f uh, 1 of x to f 2 of x which c commutes with the natural uh, with the morphisms like like is written there so if you have a morphism then this isomorphism commutes this diagram is commuted so why you need these tricky um, definitions? To, to this, you need essentially to define equivalence of categories. Otherwise, as I told you, it would be hard because uh, categories depends on the set of objects, and we don't really, we don't, we are not interested in the set of objects. For instance, because we don't want to work with sets of all sets, we want to have smaller sets. Like, we don't want to work with sets of all vector spaces because it's not a set. I mean, uh, we want to have some small sets. And we would say that, OK, there's a big category which is equivalent to a small category, and we are done. So this is why people are interested in equivalence of categories. Mm, so. Categories C1 and C2 are equivalent. If there exist functors psi from C1 to C2, psi, psi 1, psi 2 from C2 to C1, and then you take their composition. And uh, they give you equivalent functors. So psi 1, psi 2 is equivalent to identity. Identity functor on mm, uh, C, C, C to C1. And of course, psi 2. 
psi 1 is equivalent to identity on C1, on C2. And this is, of course, now the uh, exercise for you to prove that the category of all five-dimensional vector spaces and category of five-dimensional vector spaces which has just one object for each dimension are equivalent. It's not hard from that definition. OK, but uh, so there are widely different sets. I mean, one set can be like so big it's not even a set, it's a class. Another is it's just countable. But the categories are the same. This is why categories are better than sets. Because we don't care. I mean, who cares if R one R2 is different from another R2? They're all R2. You have a basis, they're equivalent. But as sets, they're, of course, different, and it makes it harder. OK, so this is the guys who invented that. Originally, the um, category theory occurred first when people started doing cohomology. Because cohomology are functors. And there are different functors. Uh, there are different functors, different cohomology theories uh, on topological spaces. But then they discovered that they're all equivalent. And to state this equivalence, you really need functors. Otherwise, it would not, not make no sense. And then they, after that, you, they realized that Eilenberg was actually part of uh, Bourbaki group. And Bourbaki was do, trying to do foundational mathematics, but they used structures, which is set theoretic, instead of categories. And Eilenberg realized that categories are actually better. And of course, Grothendieck, who did it in most uh, now, I mean, he's the guy who is responsible for that, for the categories they're used everywhere even in some differential geometry or something like that. Anyway, I, I finished uh, now with the uh, explanation of the main, I mean, why did I need, what was the, my motivation for today's and previous lecture? I will state this result, and I won't prove it, it today. I will prove it next. Uh, lecture on Monday. So last time we discussed the category of, uh, not category, just the uh, affine varieties. So by definition, affine variety is an uh, algebraic subset subset of Cn. So it's a affine variety over C. Algebraic subset of Cn with a ring of polynomial functions. So algebraic variety, if you forget, it's a subset which is given by uh, polynomial equations. So you have like finite, finitely many polynomial equations. They define your certain subset. And you consider the subset with its ring of polynomial functions on it. And then uh, this is a category. Category. Because composition of polynomial functions is clearly polynomial. And then uh, Identity is, uh, what else do we need about categories? We need identity, identity is polynomial, and we need uh, associativity, which is clear. So these are affine, affine varieties. And it turns out that this category is equivalent to another category, just of rings, but let me explain that. So definition, finally generated ring generated ring over C is a quotient of, uh, of polynomial ring T1 dollar Tn by an ideal. So what does it mean, finally, generator? This means you have generator T1 dot Tn and generators. And then 
you see, have certain relations because it's every ring which has generators and relations. And this is relations form an ideal. So this finally generated ring, and they form a category. So it's category, morphisms, uh, morphisms, aromamorphisms, C linear homomorphisms. Good. Okay, I want this ring to have no nilpotence. Yeah, uh, so definition x inside a nilpotent element in a ring if x power n is equal to 0. Have you heard about nilpotent elements? So do, do you know that they form an ideal called nil radical? And do you know that it's intersection of all prime ideals? Everybody knows? And do you know the proof? Who knows the proof? OK, we, we shall discuss the proof. Well, uh, today I don't need it. I just want your definition. And then, obviously, if you have a polynomial function, I mean, any functions on a set, they have no ideals. I mean, it's functions. It's a maps from C. And of course, if you have non-zero map to C, then its power is never zero. So these uh, rings of polynomial functions on algebraic sets, they have no mm, nilpotence. OK. So I have two categories of of is a fine varieties. And then I have another category, which is I denote CR CR is a finally generated rings, generated rings without any potence. I think they have a names and like radical rings, right? I forgot. It reduced, right? Reduced. A uh, variety is reduced. I'm not sure about rings. Okay. Reduced. Thanks. You have an obvious functor from affine to Sotherian. You know this functor, namely from a fine variety, you just take its ring of functions. Uh, so phi from, it's a uh, contravariant function, functor. So it's functor from a fine op to a CR. Uh, so it uh, uh, is an equivalence. This is what is called strong Neustein Satz. Uh, it's slightly more complicated than Neustein Satz, but in fact, the proof is very straightforward. And so the idea is that, um, so we have a ring. We want to recover the set of points, right? So what is the points? Now, the points are maximal ideals, as we follow from Neustein Satz. So really, uh, First, you, this is essentially a forgetful functor. You just you start with a fine variety, and you forget the variety. You are left with the ring of functions on it. Clearly, if you have a map of varieties, you have a map of rings. But it turns out that since varieties are the same as set of maximal ideals, you can recover variety from the ring. This is. Uh, what we shall do. And in fact, it's very important for algebraic geometry because this leaves, I mean, this allows you to study rings as geometric objects and start geometric objects as rings. I translate from geometry to algebra and back immediately by using this result. Okay. Thank you very much. And 
if somebody didn't take the assignments, please do. And if you have questions, please ask. You can ask now. No questions? OK, good.